Our next feature tonight is Jory Marie Riera. Jory is a colorful, queer, creative creature living with MCFCS, also known as chronic fatigue syndrome in the San Francisco Bay Area. She revels in writing and arting with mother tongue feminist theater, writing for wellness, dis arts, panda poets, writing for your life, next up and disability creative creativity workshop. She is a closet soprano with the heart of an alto. Thank you everybody. Um, I want to congratulate um, Karen for an absolutely fabulous reading and I'm so honored to be on the bill with you. And um, I also want to thank Sandy Anfang and Diane Mooney, Rivertown Poets and the owners of the Aquas Cafe for inviting us to be the features tonight and making it possible for us to meet here. Um, so my name is Jory and as you heard, I have MECFS or it's also known as chronic fatigue syndrome. Usually I do a pretty good job at managing my energy, but being human, I didn't do such a good job last week. So here I am reading from my bed. Here's my, my stuffed whale, Wilhelmina. This is my, my stuffed fox, Osvelt. So they'll be with me on this journey as all of you. So this poem, um, is about assumptions some people have about people like me who have chronic illness assumptions i am in bed as the sick should be and i rest and i sleep but sometimes i am in bed as the sick should be and i am writing i am collaging i am sketching what a nice vacation for you. I wish I could be in bed all day. I wish I could work on my art. I wish I didn't have to work. You want a vacation where you don't go anywhere? You want to be in bed all day because you can hardly move? You want to live this life of leisure because you're too sick to earn a living? You want to go, you want to get by on SSDI? By all means, be my guest. I am not always suffering as the sick should suffer. I am guilty of joy. I am guilty of laughter. I am guilty of hope. How dare I live my life within the time, space, energy I am allotted? How dare I dare you to do the same? This poem is called Beholder. Mama worships at the altar of Miss America, entranced by the creamy skinned, sashed sachet. When I pretend to accept the rose bouquet and crown, Mama tells me I am ugly when I smile. I take off my toilet paper sash if only I could be beautiful, Mama would look at me with adoration. When I am in grade school, Mama covers me in foundation, eyeshadow, rouge, to make me look better. But the nuns send me home. Not only am I ugly, I'm inappropriate. Playing beauty parlor, the other girls complain about my thick, straight hair that refuses to hold a braid. Boys tease the shape of my eyes, the color of dark brown dirt instead of light blue sky. My skin color is not found in the Crayola box of eight or 10 or even 64. So I choose green and the nuns scold me. If only I could be beautiful. The other kids would like me. I'd have my own crayon and the nuns would leave me alone. This poem um, is called At My Limit, and it's, um, it's about talking back to God. <laughs> At My Limit, life. Had I known what was in store, 
I would have been like Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane, slumped over a rock, praying so hard I bled, begging you, God, take away that damn cup. Cup, saucer, spoon, I want none of it. And yes, I let it all happen to me. Hunger, loneliness, abuse, mental illness, oh yes. I burn bright as a dying star. I cast shadows like toxic smoke. Don't lose you, God. I didn't know you were there to lose. And now, here I am. On the other side of my particular grim fairy tale, here I am. Had I known what I had to live through to get here, I would have refused your hand. I would have knocked over your cup. I would have said, no, thank you. Glam Wednesday. As a little Catholic girl, every Ash Wednesday, the priest smudged ash on my forehead in the shape of a cross, intoning, remember that you are dust, and unto dust you shall return. As a post-Catholic person, I propose Glam Wednesday, where the celebrant anoints my forehead with glitter oil in the shape of a star, singing, remember that you are stardust, and unto stardust you shall return. For my body is a quirky constellation, glitter dust randomly flung to the heavens, no telescope can sight me, and my dear body is made of cosmic dust falling to earth. My tired, worried, anxious body, my padded, pandemic body, I give you thanks for every breath, every gasp of surprise, every hiccuping sob, every giggle and snort, I give you thanks for my frailty and my ferocity, my imperfection and my impossibility my stubbornness and stupendousness, I give you thanks for housing the galaxy of my tender heart and savage soul. I give you thanks knowing that I am stardust and unto stardust I will return. Shopping with my sister my sister and I are shopping at Nordstrom's, a place we don't normally go. Despite their reputation for excellent customer service, we've got a gift certificate. So even though there's nothing we really need, we find something and look for a cashier. We walk over to her station and stand there. The cashier looks right over us. Maybe she looks through us. In any case, the white cashier waves at a customer behind us. She greets her, rings her up. We are standing right there. My sister and I look at each other. Were these women oblivious or were we invisible? This has happened many times to me, but this time I'm with my sister. Together, we are witness, we can corroborate we are humiliated. We wait, finally get rung up, and never speak of it. English class at San Francisco State. A young man makes a homophobic comment. I look at him. Is he just joking? No. He's serious. He's truly offended. The writer he admired is gay, and now he has to rescind his admiration. I look at our teacher. She is gay. Surely she'll say something to diffuse, to educate, to redirect. But she says nothing. And I am no better because I am unable to process what he's saying. His words are so over the top and out of place in this classroom. No one says anything. My teacher's eyes are vacant. She's already left the room. I am witness. I am queer. 
I am bisexual and I am silent. Now I welcome you to my kitchen. This is called flower hour. There is coziness in the kitchen. When bowls and cups nest, there's a bit of tough love when tofu gets squeezed, separation anxiety when sugar gets sifted, integration when flour is folded. There is drama in the kitchen, the tense suspense of flipping over the bunt pan, praying the cake comes out in one piece. A bright bevy of spatulas stand ready, the helpful little orange spatula that digs out stubborn muffins from the tin, the odd purple spatula that gets every bit of honey from the jar, the oversized chartreuse spatula ready to flip the most unwieldy of pancakes. There is lamentation in the kitchen when part of the cake clings to the bunt pan while the rest falls and thunks onto the plate. I slice the chunks, artfully fanning them over the crumbs, desperately decorating with whipped cream and berries. There are lessons in the kitchen. On days when I fall apart, I take that chartreuse spatula and cover myself every inch in whipped cream and berries. And this is um, called 2022, the year of the tiger. Last year, so much grief, so many tears, farewells fond and those not so, and yet I am hopeful. Left paw paused on the threshold, right paw poised to tear away the last calendar page and begin again. This will be my year, the year of the water tiger. I will swim with ferocity, bold stripes and powerful jaws. I will pad among you with impatient snarls, warning growls, meows of inquiry, purrs of benediction, my claws retracted, but at the ready to destroy, to create, to destroy, to recreate, to rend, to repair. I will pounce on possibility and leap to the sky with joy. This next is a true story and I dedicate it to my husband of 30 years. It's called Bird's Eye View. The big gray cat knocks me to the ground with her enormous paw. She bats at me. I am stunned. Surely death is near. A door squeaks open. The sound of big footsteps, a calm voice pitched low. The cat runs away. The large footsteps come closer and then from the heavens, hands reach down, gently raising me up. Bespeckled eyes regard me kindly. A rumbling voice soothes my feathers, slows the beat of my heart. I lie on my side resting in the safety of this large, warm palm. I regard God with my small black eye. God is awesome, immense, smiling. God regards me in wonder. For long moments we commune. And when I am ready, I fly from God's hand. Hearing the exclamation, the exultation, I will never forget who gave me my life. This next one is um, about a fish in the middle of a road. And it's from the point of view of the fish, just like the last one was the point of view of the bird. It's called the trout in the road. Yes, yes, I know you are one of those people who stop for squirrels, break for deer, escort raccoon families from one sewer to another, but a trout in the road has you flummoxed. I can tell. By your puzzled expression, the furrow of disbelief, how, 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 
Your mouth opens and closes like mine, gasping, which is what I'm doing while I await your judgment. Are you a savior or a witness to my demise, a Samaritan or a shocked bystander? There's a body of water nearby. I try prompting you with my fin. Hell, at this point, I'd even take a sip from your water bottle. I don't have much time. <gasps> your hand is hot on my scaled skin. Now I fly through the air. <gasps> the splash is painful, but I managed to swim away. Thanks, human. This is Ears Over Tail, a love story. To my fabulous fish-loving feline friend, I am fulminating with fond feelings, for you are my frisky fancy forever. And if you ever find yourself fearful of my fickleness, you must trust this fundamental fact. Our connection is bona fide, not some febrile fantasy. It fairly transcends my frustrating allergy to your fine cat hair. Doubters are fussy, fallacious, fuddy-duddies. They are as forgettable as fabric that's out of fashion. But I shall never forget falling for you last February, or any time I've spent with your furry, fun-filled self since. I savor the flavor of our every moment like bites of my favorite fudge. And with fantastic new pharmaceuticals to facilitate our relationship, we can focus on looking forward to a future of many years hand in paw and here is the last poem it's called stand in it may or may not be a true story <laughs> stand in as soon as i exit the stage i look at the clock i have just enough time to make it to the farmer's market so i rush out in full costume and makeup to race around the vegetable stalls, grabbing squash, apples, potatoes, chard, garlic, mushrooms. When I throw open the dressing room door, one of the actresses is screaming, where's the baby? Where the hell is the baby? I put my bag down to help search, but it seems the prop baby has left the building, which causes the actress to totally freak out when someone says, hey, we can use this. We all turn to see the stage manager holding up my butternut squash. Artfully wrapped in a blue sweatshirt, the squash makes, it, makes its debut seconds later in the arms of her nurse. And when I make my entrance, I can see the other actors trying not to crack up. When the baby is passed amongst them, they say, She's so beautiful. She looks just like you. Congratulations, my boy. And when I say, it's my turn, let me hold her. I look down tenderly at the squash's blank face and say, oh, aren't you the sweetest little pumpkin? Someone snorts in the background. I ignore it and continue my lines. I could just eat you up. I don't know how we make it to curtain call. We are all dying of suppressed laughter, but as soon as the curtain falls, it's mayhem. Backstage, the butternut gets tossed around, and for weeks afterward, there are squash jokes. They say that art imitates life, and I have to say, just as one baby brings the family together on stage, one vegetable has brought the cast and crew together off stage, and the missing prop baby Oh, that's another story. Thank you.